final speaker for tonight, and that is Kaitan. Um, and Kaitan is a former construction engineer, and he's now building software instead. He works as a front-end developer at SoftServe, and he loves learning new things and sharing his findings with others via tech talks and articles. So on that note, I'd love to welcome Kaitan to the stage. Hello, Kaitan. Hi, hello. Do you see Am me? I, Do you hear me? I hear you. I see you. Um, mm -hmm. Are you ready to share your screen, maybe? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's getting dark. Okay. Yeah, it's getting dark here. Uh, okay. I am sharing my screen. So hopefully you can see it now. Yeah, we can. Okay. All right, the stage is yours. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, today I'd like to tell you some things about Elm. And before that, I'd like to start with sharing uh, with you some personal story of mine. And this is a story of how, how I was uh, fascinated with uh, functional programming to begin with. And this story took place around two years ago on my uh, local TypeScript meetup in my city of Wrocław. And then uh, the, the theme of the meetup was uh, functional programming. And uh, there were two talks. One of them was about uh, Marble.js, that is a TypeScript library for creating backends with TypeScript, RxJS, and uh, Mm, functional reactive programming paradigm. And the other one was uh, about how static typing help uh, solving basic functional programming mm, principles like uh, function composition. And I remember, remember from back, back then that I understood maybe a 10% of what was said. And this was for two reasons. First one was that beforehand i didn't really know what functional programming really was and the second one was at that time i had only maybe a six months of experience as a developer like a professional experience in my first job and also a six months of experience with typescript so sometimes even if some intermediate topics of, of typescript were mentioned i couldn't quite grasp those yet fully and I remember from that, back, from that time that something really wonderful happened because I wasn't discouraged by this uh, confusion of mine, this lack of knowledge, but I was fascinated by the new things I like to, to I like, mm, mm, I, uh, sorry, the new things that I could learn and the, by the puzzle itself. So I remember just rushing back home as soon as I can and just reading articles, uh, watching video tutorials, etc., about uh, functional programming. And I think that this adventure of mine with FP continues to this day. And you can th treat, this, uh, treat this presentation as a sum up of my first year of learning functional programming in a JavaScript ecosystem. And with this talk, I'd like to present you why I think that Elm is a delightful language for learning functional programming. Uh, of course, I was already introduced, but all, uh, I want to just say that uh, if you want to follow my work, you can uh, you can uh, see me on Twitter at kaitansw or on my blog kaitan.dev. So today I'd like to start with something general. I'd like to sell you functional programming and tell you why should you even be interested in this paradigm. Then I'll tell you what is Elm. Why should you at least try it? Of course, this is a TypeScript meetup. So I added a section when, where I uh, compare all those two technologies, Elm and TypeScript. And at the end, I'd like to just uh, mm, tell you about alternatives to Elm, so other FP languages that compile to JavaScript. So why should you be even interested in functional programming? I think if you ask 
any functional programmer uh, what is the basic principle or the basic block of the uh, FP language. And those will be pure functions. And those are called like that before, because of two reasons. First one is that uh, for, for the same input, they always return the same output. And the second one, they, that they don't have any side effects. And I'd like to I like to think about side effects as any operation that requires accessing to some external resources, like external resources to the function scope itself. So whenever we have to grab some data via HTTP or read something from file or write something to a console, or even grab some variable that is outside of a function scope, that is something that it's possible for example in JavaScript, that is uh, that is considered a side effect. So you could ask how exactly should we create our programs in functional programming paradigm if we have if our pure functions cannot have side effects? And there is even a, a joke in a functional programming community that, uh, community that if you get rid of any side effects from uh, from our programs, the biggest thing we could do is to heat up our computers. And this is quite true. And this is because languages like Haskell or Elm have their own way to handle side effects. For Haskell, those are monads. And for Elm, it is something different. And I'll explain what exactly later. So the next principle is immutability. Um, let's consider we have some array and we'd like to add something to it or remove from something from it, or we have some object that we have, uh, that we want to update field there. In the functional, in, in principle of immutability, we wouldn't update the, the data structure itself at some reference, but we, but we would uh, create a copy of this data structure with the updated piece of it. And I think mutability and immutability is a pretty debatable subject, uh, pretty much because it has its advantages and disadvantages. We can, we can think of disadvantages of immutability as uh, it might be not uh, as performant as it can be, because just let, let's imagine uh, making some op uh, operation heavy update on, on some quite large data structure. But I'd like to just point out that functional programming languages like Haskell or, or Elm choose immutability of data structures. The next one is easier testing. And I think this is a consequence of the last two principles. So pure functions and immutability. And this is because with those two, we can uh, treat our programs, which is composed of all the pure functions as deterministic, deterministic as in uh, math functions. So we can easily uh, uh, easily predict the behavior that for, of our functions or our program. So the, hence, they are uh, easier to test. The next one is constant growth. Constant growth in terms of the languages themselves, all the tooling around them. Uh, the community itself, the learning resources, the job market needs, etc. Some time ago, we wouldn't even think uh, about languages like Haskell as something production ready, maybe, uh, because not many uh, companies were using them. They were considered as languages that is that were used strictly for academia. And right now, there is a lot of demand for. FP developers and uh, experts in FP field, and more and more companies use those uh, to create their, their own products. The same thing is with learning FP. Uh, if you want, some time ago you would only consider some uh, enormous heavy books with category theory, and everyone would tell you that category theory is the only thing that uh, is the only thing that you should do to uh, before learning Haskell or other FP languages. But right now we have 
so many resources, so many to so many uh, tutorials, videos, etc. That with many different approaches to it, so you can just pick one and start learning. And the last thing I think that functional programming broadens your mind. And I remember that in my case, when I started learning functional programming and was reading all those principles, I felt like my uh, a different sections of my brain was just started to being used because uh, I I was my background is from object oriented programming. This is what was taught to me at my university at my first work. And I was just quite excited to uh, experience this new puzzle. So what exactly is Elm? Like the first page of the, of the language itself, uh, it says that Elm is a delightful language for reliable web applications. So Elm is a FP language that compiles to JavaScript and it, it is designed and created strictly for creating web applications. So you cannot create, you use it to create backends, systems, etc. only web applications. Why should you at least, at least try Elm? Well, the, the first thing is that uh, learning Elm would give you all the advantage of the FP world that I've mentioned. So pure functions, immutability, easier testing, constant uh, constant growth of uh, the um, Elm ecosystem, Elm language, Elm tooling libraries, etc., And also learning it, of course, broadens your mind. Now let's consider two worlds, the world of easy and hard uh, languages. So easy and hard, it's really a relative thing and uh, maybe subjective thing because uh, uh, one thing, what means easy? Easy means that uh, you can, it's the time, the amount of time that you need to uh, take to grab a language you don't know learn the basics of it and do something meaningful with so uh, it's of course very uh, subjective one person can learn a language in two days and other person can learn it in two weeks and i would i'll be talking in this example uh, about three languages and i just wanted to compare the easiness or uh, the easiness of those three languages uh, but just i just want to stick or uh, to some overall statistics that I've seen before. So in this example, I would consider an easy uh, language as a, uh, the JavaScript, the easy language. And of course, the JavaScript isn't so easy, but if we compare it with Haskell, it's quite easy. If we, for example, compare uh, the hello world example of both, uh, for JavaScript, we need to only know that there is something like a console log function and we provide some argument to it to write to the console. But with Haskell, despite the fact that hello world in Haskell is quite easy to write, it has uh, quite few uh, characters to write, uh, you touch some uh, unknown abstractions like monad. So where in this um, where in this example Elm lives, I think it lives in the middle of those both worlds, because uh, it's quite easy to adopt. It was designed so that uh, it could be easily adopted, especially for um, developers' experience with JavaScript, because it's some it has some quite familiar uh, syntax and uh, features, and from Haskell it adopts. Uh, pure functions, immutability, and some useful data structures that, has, that are known for uh, functional programmers. The next interesting thing about Elm is Elm architecture. And this is the, uh, the architecture created for Elm that um, that tell us how to structure the internal state of our applications and how events are passed through and uh, how the events are used within our application. So everything starts with a model. 
And model is a, just a type. And you can um, you can compare it with with the concept of state in some state management libraries like NGRX for Angular or Redux. And then we have a view which is represented with a view function that is built in into Elm. And view function takes a current model as an argument and returns a template that should be rendered to the user. From the view, um, from the scope of view, we can send something called message uh, messages that is that can be compared to state management libraries uh, actions. For example, you have some button with the on click event, and then we then we can byte some some message that we define ourselves, and th this message when sent is captured by the update function. And update is a function that takes the captured message, the current model, and returns a new model. And within the mm, life, cy life cycle of our application, the, this, uh, this uh, graph goes on and on and on. There is also something called Elm runtime. And this is something like a black box that we are not allowed to touch. And, but this is something that we can talk with. And Elm runtime is, uh, is a concept that let us deal with side effects within, within Elm applications. So for example, if we want to cre create, a, do a HTTP request, we some, so send some specific command that is captured by the Elm runtime. Elm runtime does its operation, does a request and uh, waits for the response. And the, when the response of this example HTTP request is uh, is is captured, the Elm runtime sends a message. This in, and the process goes like previously. The message is captured by update, and the new model is created. So that, now I'd like to tell you how uh, show you just example Elm um, the. Mm, the simplest example of Elm application there is, a counter application. So as a model in this counter application, we have a counter, we have two buttons and one button, one button for incrementing the counter and the second one to decrement the counter. So our model in this example is just a simple integer and the built-in init function allows us to initiate our model. So in this case, it's zero. And there's a view function that takes a current model and, and returns a, a template. And the template is represented by, uh, of course, HTML elements. And HTML elements are represented by specific functions. And all of those functions for all elements are structured. So as the first argument, they take a list of attributes. And the second one, uh, the second argument is a list of children. So in this example, we have uh, uh, we have a div that contains a button, text, and the next button. Uh, notice for the uh, notice that for the buttons we bind uh, messages to them. So there are two types of messages represented by uh, the sum type, or in TypeScript it's called union. And it's a increment and a decrement. And the update function takes the mes captured, message, captured message, the current model, and based on the using case statement, we can, uh, um, based on the message, create a new model. And the next thing is something that absolutely 100% absolutely sold me on Elm. And this is this was a promise of no runtime errors and no null no or undefined. And this is something that totally blew my mind when I heard, first heard of it, because I was quite fed up at the time with all those null pointer exceptions and uh, errors like type error cannot find field name of undefined or something like that. I'm pretty much fed up with those also now, but uh, nevertheless. 
uh, how Elm achieves those. Uh, it achieves, the, achieves those uh, with a very strict type system and also some additional features, like, for example, decoders. And decoders or uh, JSON decoders or ARM decoders, well, uh, they are used, for example, in uh, creating a GET request. For that, we can use a GET method built, that is built in, in the HTTP uh, module. It takes URL and it takes uh, something called expect within which we uh, we specify which exactly data structure we want to uh, we expect as a return of uh, of the request so the body of the response so in this example in this imaginary application when we want to fetch some hero data uh, we expect a json structure as a return then we can for this it is represented in a by the uh, expect JSON function. Then uh, we pass the message that should be sent by the uh, Elm runtime where the request is finished, and also the Elm decoder. And Elm decoder is just a is just a function composed of many atomic decoders because the, in Elm there are atomic decoders, for example, primitive data types like string, boolean, integer, etc. And there are decoders for composing small decoders into bigger ones like a list of something or uh, records or dictionary. So we have to, uh, whenever we talk with the outside world, we have to provide uh, Elm decoder to communicate with Elm compiler or Elm runtime that this is the, the specific data structure that we want to uh, get as a return. And I talk about that because in TypeScript, uh, we are not quite forced, forced in a good way, I think, uh, forced in, into creating, uh, into covering the failure scenario of our fetch request, requests. So if we are using, for example, fetch API to fetch something, we just, um, we just declare that this, uh, uh, this uh, structure that we get as a return uh, would be this and this. But what if our uh, this API that we are uh, sending requests to are are out of our control? So they are um, they are maintained by some other team or are um, or, or are completely external like uh, Google Maps API. So if the API changes, we would get some runtime errors and our applications would probably blow up and we wouldn't know exactly why. And we because we wouldn't just cover uh, this failure uh, case. And now the battle of giants, so Elm versus TypeScript. And I think it's fair to just point out at the beginning that those are those are fundamentally different uh, technologies, because Elm is a full-blown functional programming language that is compiled to JavaScript, whereas the TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, so it's a, like an extension to the existing language. So the first thing is that Elm prevents run runtime data inconsistency like API changes and TypeScript not exactly uh, because it didn't it doesn't force us to cover those uh, examples like I said forces I th when I use word forces it I mean it in a good way because it results uh, in the end in safer applications and this is because th uh, this is because uh, the the other this disadvantage comes from the nature of uh, JavaScript as a dynamic language, but can be uh, compensated by using some libraries like IOTS or Zot for creating some something called runtime types within TypeScript. The next thing is that in uh, in Elm there is no concept of null or undefined. Those are uh, represented by types like maybe. And in TypeScript, there are 
know and are defined there, and it also comes from JavaScript. The next thing is immutability. Uh, Elm does, uh, has it, TypeScript doesn't. But like I pointed earlier, types, uh, immutability can be used uh, for the greater good, for the greater good. Uh, for example, for optimizing some operations on larger data structures. And also we can compensate those, uh, those need for immutable data structures by using some additional libraries uh, uh, like Emer. In Elm, there is no uh, concept of any or unknown, uh, like in TypeScript. But I think also it also comes with, from the nature of JavaScript. But um, any can be used in good things uh, because it was uh, created for for projects that are steadily migrating from JavaScript and TypeScript. Okay, the next thing. Um, I think that Elm prevents poor typing from third party libraries that we would like to use in our applications, strictly because all those mechanism like, mechanisms like decoders I've mentioned, and also the overall strict uh, typing of Elm. And in TypeScript, let's be honest, uh, that's uh, it's very easy for uh, library authors for to just convert uh, all uh, files with, from JS to TS and don't add, and don't add any types to TypeScript and everything is just any and they they could very well publish this as a library. I, and I think at the end, all tech, all, both those technologies are easy to adopt in existing project. In TypeScript, all we have to do is uh, uh, change the extension from GS, uh, JS to TS and add types. Of course, I tell you that's just the case, but uh, sometimes it's not that easy. But uh, in uh, Elm, it's uh, easy because we can create an Elm application within our project and just specify a concrete uh, HTML element the and there the Elm application would be rendered. I also wanted to mention some um, TypeScript libraries that can be used to write uh, functional uh, functionally uh, with TypeScript, and those are, for example, FPTS, which I think is the the biggest library with the richest ecosystem for. Uh, functional programming within TypeScript. It also has some, I would say, plugin-based library ecosystem, like many libraries with many extensions. And something uh, uh, different, uh, and I mean effect TS, that is also a FP library that is uh, inspired by Zio. And fun fact, the uh, on the previous TypeScript Berlin meetup, the author of FT FPTS had this had his uh, talk about FXTS, and I recommend it to you to watch it. And uh, other languages that compile to JavaScript, and I've picked only a few, uh, the most intriguing in my opinion. The first one is Rescript, is uh, and it's a FP language that is created by Facebook. The second one is PureScript, and it's my favorite favorite right now, and it's something that I've dove uh, that I've dove into some some time ago, and I would um, I would think about type about PureScript as a Haskell in JavaScript ecosystem. So it's a language that is heavily inspired by Haskell. And the next thing is Scala with Scala.js. Of course, Scala is not pure functional programming language, but I mention it just because uh, it has very, very big uh, functional programming community. Uh, the next is our examples of uh, L maps that I want to present that I wanted to present to you because I think that real learning by examples uh, example is something that 
uh, some of you may enjoy. On the left, you can find a QR code for my own Elm survey app that I've uh, created strictly for this uh, presentation. And it takes you through some simple survey. The next thing is real world example app. And it's a pretty brilliant initiative that is, uh, uh, that is a clone of existing Medium platform and it's implemented across multiple repositories in different technologies, uh, separately front-end and separately back-end. So, for example, if you want to check out uh, the front-end of this application in Elm and back-end with, I don't know, Elixir or Express.js or something like that, you can uh, you can download those repositories and uh, connect those and play with those. And I think that might be a good approach if you are familiar with, uh, for example, Angular or React, you can download uh, the real world application in this, uh, in those technologies and create uh, and download application in Elm and just compare those, how those work with the same application. And there's also an interactive playground within the uh, main Elm Lang page. Also, I wanted to share with you some learning resources that I've used for learning Elm. So uh, for, uh, as the first one is a beginning Elm. It's uh, quite nice and uh, uh, quite nice and big uh, tutorial with creating uh, some example application along the way. There's also uh, official docs. There's an awesome Elm on GitHub, and this is just a list of tutorials, articles, videos, etc. And you can pick one of those and start learning. And at the end, uh, there is a talk by Ivan Chaplitsky, and he is uh, author of Elm. And uh, in this talk, he presents you with some design choices for Elm. And that's it from my side. And thank you all for listening. And thank, thank you also for organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Kaitan. Uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, I think there's also interesting questions um, in the chat. Um, yeah, I think the the first one I think that comes to mind when I was learning Redux a while back, and this is a question that I think came from Tristan Lucas was um, if you could compare some part of the Elm runtime to a Redux uh, reducer. Is it is it a fair statement to even say that Redux was heavily influenced by uh, the sort of the Elm way of handling side effects? Mm, okay, I didn't. Uh mentioned it, I wanted to mention it as a fun fact, but uh, Elm is, uh, like Redux is inspired by Flux architecture and Flux architecture was inspired by Elm. So there is a connection between those. And if you want to compare uh, Redux reducers to something from Elm, I would compare it with the update function because it also deals with messages like the reducer deals with uh, actions. Mm -hmm. Got it. And when it comes to, you, you spoke a lot about the, the role of immutability and the importance. Are there any parallels between um, sort of the uh, immutable data structures in Elm and the kind of like persistent immutable data structures that you have in something like Clojure and Clojure script? Or am I thinking about it the wrong way? Mm, I don't quite know how to answer this question. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Let's keep it. Um, uh, let's see. We I think we also had an interesting question um, from Jakub. Why Elm not pure script? Um, pure script shall not be only limited to the web. Okay. I've I've created this uh, talk strictly because I think I thought that uh, Elm is. Elm was cool, at least for me, as a language to start fun learning functional programming. And uh, before I started diving into it, I was uh, thinking about all those alternatives like uh, like PureScript and Elixir and other languages. But I picked Elm strictly because it's so quite easy to pick up. 
and it was created and designed such a, such a language to be quickly uh, picked up, especially for JavaScript developers. So that's why I've picked it up. And PureScript is quite more, uh, quite more difficult because uh, all of those uh, math abstractions that is going on like uh, monads, etc. So I didn't want to dive into those. I wanted to di dive into uh, the, mo the more basic uh, concepts. And that's why after learning uh, Elm for some time, I started diving and uh, just reading articles and reading even a pure script book to, to just learn pure script because like you, like the commander said, uh, pure script, it's true. It's not also limited to the front end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's and... quite, sorry. It, it's also quite <laughs> more challenging for my mind and just that's why I picked it up also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just that I, I imagine that would be like sheer pragmatism. Um, so, uh, what are some of the, what are the most difficult Elm concepts or syntax to grasp when we transition from TS to Elm? Do you have any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. If I. Mm. I'm trying to. I've been trying to remember the the mindset of of person learning Elm. So I think the most difficult concept for me was to concept of uh, dealing with messages and also with Elm runtime. I was pretty a little bit confused about those, but and also the coders. Yeah. I think the coders was uh, the Elm decoders was quite also difficult to grasp for me at least. Mm -hmm. And are you using Elm in production in any capacity? No, this is this was uh, the Elm was used by me only as a learning resource, I guess. I just wanted to play with it a little and learn maybe a FP principles more than a, a language itself. So I, the, for example, the only application ever uh, that I've created is this Elm survey that I've, uh, that I've posted in my, uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. 